Years ago, I was talking to Claudia Nuremberg, and I told myself that I wasn't going to be that old, cranky, curmudgeon old guy. And uh, I'm that guy. <laughs> she said, oh, no, Jim, you were impatient back then. You're just still impatient. <laughs> so, um, yeah, now when I look at the, you know, I was just thinking the, from the two talks, the, um, it looks to me like the climate's changing faster than our institutions are. Um, so maybe we all ought to be pretty impatient. Um, anyhow, uh, so what, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is we're really uh, we're incorporating uh, more than 30 years of learning into our project design and implementation. Um, we've benefited from uh, everything we learned from RISA, from the IAI, from the IRI, International Research Institute for Climate Society, in our project. And our project is a five-year project funded by NOAA and with the title of Integrating Climate Information into Decision Processes for Regional Climate Resilience. It started in 2013, goes to 2018, uh, hopefully longer. But um, it, it's really based on uh, this uh, belief, certainly on my part, um, and no evidence to show otherwise, that historically the research community working on the demand side, those producing vulnerability assessments or stakeholder need assessments, et cetera, work separately from those who are producing the models that give the forecasts and do the, the supply side. Well, we've formed a team of both, and for five years we're working together. And so, um, as you can imagine, it's a grand experiment really in itself. So I'm going to touch on my three main points. I'm going to uh, highlight the critical components or ingredients for our project, that is uh, the criteria uh, that we've determined must be met in order for it to be a, a project within our uh, five-year grant. I'm gonna um, highlight three very specific parts of our project, uh, in, uh, two in Jamaica and one in India. And then I'm gonna finish with uh, remaining challenges uh, and put that out there. So, a critical ingredients. Um, as I just mentioned, it must be fully integrated. Both supply and demand research teams have to work together. You can't come up with, oh, why don't we go off and do some uh, other climate forecasting uh, as a spinoff. Mm, okay, you can do that, but don't call it um, an IRAP, International Research and Applications Project. Uh, it, it must be fully integrated. Um, it, we. Um, Back to the co-design and co-producing, um, we will be working with, in every case, with the local users of the information who will be identified as well as local producers of information, that is counterparts and researchers in the place. Um, that through evaluation, we're gonna go from, um, and I, we call it useful uh, to usable to used. So, you, you know, we, we produce stuff, climate forecasters say, oh, this stuff is really useful. And then stakeholders say, hmm, okay, it is usable, but we're gonna go all the way to used and evaluate that and demonstrate all the way. And the evaluation is critically important. That it's not a hypothetical demand that we're identifying, but a real demand. In fact, the demander has a name and a face and part of our team. Um, that, um, that we also have to have something to offer, that there has to be a predictability or something about the climate system that we have to be able to say that is of value um, that we design sustainability right into the project, that is long-term sustainability, that, we, that long after we are gone, that the project will have its legs and keep going. Um, that, uh, as I mentioned, that there's, uh, oh, um, on the scaling thing, uh, Kai, and I'll come back to that, because, and I think uh, Susie, a lot of people have talked about it, um, it, it has to be scalable, and in fact, we're gonna design our players to include scalability. Um, and I'll come back to that. Rigorous evaluation of impact uh, from the onset, that uh, using a theory of change, so we can say, okay, based on our baseline, our control groups, and our experiment, we can say that our intervention, what we provided the system, led to an impact, hopefully a positive one. Um, and that the capacity building be built in. So uh, with all players um, across both uh, the supply and demand chain. So those are the critical ingredients. There are others, but I'm going to just uh, focus on those. Now, the, th uh, the first project I'll talk about is uh, in Jamaica. Um, it's about coffee. It's so important to a lot of us. Um, it, 
there is something called le coffee leaf rust. It's a fungus that, get, that gets on the leaf, kills coffee, and at the tune of about $350 million worth of coffee across the Caribbean, Central America per year. Well, we were um, a, in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, presenting our work back in May of 2014, and uh, Elizabeth Johnson, our demander, um, came up and said, we've got this problem. We think the way you describe what you're doing, you could help us, because we think that there's a climate com component on this coffee leaf uh, rust. So, um, uh, so that's how we designed our project product. Well, on the demand side, we start with a vulnerability assessment, and I think you all know what those look like. It's, you know, collect a bunch of data, ask a bunch of questions, and then from that can derive the vulnerability of the coffee producing and the um, community um, uh, to uh, a climatic uh, event. We do new user needs assessments, so you, you have some information that you use. What else can you, do you need? maybe we can provide it, and then um, also understanding the full social network, do an analysis of the social network. What are the, how does communication get moved around? Where are the, the, uh, who are the power brokers? Who are people who add value to information, et cetera? So I mentioned our demander is Elizabeth Johnson. Um, she's with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, IECA. She also, um, so that's a scalability issue. That's not just coffee and it's not just Jamaica, it's across the region. So she's already built in because if she sees success there, she can take it to um, other, uh, other sectors or other part of uh, agriculture and also part other places. At the table from the outset also is the, the Coffee Industry Board. Uh, those are the people who represent industry, and uh, and farmers are at the table. So they represent even the people who are uh, the farmers, members of their um, of their organization, um, and that rep represents local demand, not just a the theoretical or hypothetical, and and therefore also sustainability over the long run. They can afford to pay for things over the long run. The Coffee Buyers Association, again, much like the industry board, it's another group. I mentioned IECA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture. That meets the scale up to the region and sustainability over the long run. Uh, scalability beyond, the, beyond our project. The Jamaican Ag Department to be able to keep funding things because if you can save uh, millions of dollars, maybe it's worth something. On the supply side, um, the UFA and our counterparts at Columbia University IRI, responsible for project design, we're conveners, we do capacity and training, uh, we do research and evaluation, but we do it with our partners, the University of West Indies, UE, who are also, also have these counterparts, so we're working together, and, and when we do work together, then we can build capacity in, uh, there too, we involve their graduate students, et cetera. We also involve the Jamaican Meteorological Service and their Ag Extension, the, uh, they call it RADA, Regional something or other. Um, I don't know what the ADA part means. Um, and then there's a CIMH, Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. It's like a regional MET service for the, for broader, for the broader region. They can, that can scale up the supply side, right? So um, the CIMH, this latter one, recognizing the need for social sciences, is asked to us to help them train them up in the social sciences. And so we've begun that. We've spent two, they spent two weeks uh, with us. We're gonna go, they're going to pay for us to go out to them, and over two years we're going to go through all of this process. Now the danger is this notion that all you got to do is get sort of a certificate in social sciences and now you're good at it. Um, and you, and it's, you know, those are equal to PhDs. Well, those are real dangers, and we recognize that. Um, nevertheless, the, on a scalability thing, the World Meteorological Organization, through its Global Framework for Climate Services and its regional climate centers, are looking now at what we're doing in social sciences and say, why don't you be a flagship for the, the other places in the world? Okay. Jamaica Drought uh, Tool Valuation, IRI, and uh, working with the JMA came in and gave forecasts to uh, farmers, not now we're moving beyond coffee, just farmers. In 2014 and 2015, there were 11 farmer forums, that's gathering of farmers and uh, climate folks, plus um, a text messages with, to cell phones of farmers that identified that they wanted to have that. Um, a, so we were asked, well, after all this happened, can you come in and, and actually put a dollar value to it? 
because the, uh, the USAID people had funded were getting um, anecdotal evidence that it was of value. They wanted the real dollars uh, at it. And it was really hard because we came in later. We didn't have a control group. We didn't know how they set it up, et cetera. But nevertheless, we came up with the defensible numbers. And that demonstrated that if, you, if you're a farmer who on your own have identified, this is an open-ended question in our survey, on your own identified that uh, water and weather uh, is a, uh, a factor that, can, that, that limits their uh, ability to produce um, and that they participate in farmer forums and they receive the text messages, messages they were able to reduce by 34% their losses. They didn't make, they didn't grow, but, uh, but they reduced their losses, extrapolated across $200 million uh, for the country. So what does that do? Um, that actually... Um, it helps convince the Ag Ministry that there's value here and then invest. Um, uh, okay. What did we learn from that? I'm going to skip, uh, I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip India, but we can talk about India some other time. It's a cool project. Especially because it's in a, in a state called Bihar and not to be confused with Bihar. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, is, a, is smaller than the state of Virginia but it has 120 million people in it. And unlike, say, a 300 uh, household sample of farmers in Jamaica, we're actually collecting data, finishing this month, with 7,000 households. And the lesson here, which is a, uh, I think is an interesting one, is hook into a project that the World Bank has been doing for five years. You can take things to scale very quickly when you have someone on your team that's worked on that project, and then you bring in your concept that you've demonstrated in a little itty-bitty place like Jamaica, and then you can go and demonstrate something in, in India, and you have that infrastructure. So hook into that. You can, you can scale up very quickly. But here's what we've, uh, we've, we see as remaining challenges. Maintaining this project is bitchin' difficult, given distances, given um, uh, differences, and I don't need to go over that. You all know what I mean by that, I think. Managing the many tensions, be and, tensions be and I've counted 18. I'll only give you a few. Between the disciplines. Yeah, anthropologists see the world one way and geographers another way. It's like, I thought you guys were the same, but no, they're not. Um, eh, <laughs> and they collect data differently, so what they call data is different. And it's just really, that, that's a tension that we have to manage. Research to operations is another tension that we have to manage. We can go into that more. Publish versus apply, that's another tension we've identified in the past. Physical science, social science, that's another tension. And all these tensions, managing that tension to keep this team together. Remember, there's a reason why supply side or, or the, the, the climate forecasting community works on their own separately and the other community works on their own separately. There's a reason why here we are in 2016 say, hmm, maybe we ought to try it together. The, the teams can fall apart very, very quickly. It uh, requires a human, huge amount. Um, eh, another challenge, and I'm almost done, operationalizing social science. So we know pretty much how to operationalize the physical science, right? We have this, these models, we run them, we've already got that model, we put in new data, new, uh, new uh, initialization, uh, et cetera, and we've got, we just run these models. So the, it doesn't mean that we don't have more research to do, we just pretty much know how to operationalize from research to operations in the physical science. But what about the social science? If we've got to be doing vulnerability assessments and things change from place to place, and that communities change from time to time, and these assessments take a long time, and they're expensive because you've got to sort of go to household to household. And so how do you actually operationalize that so that you can come together jointly as communities? That's the remaining challenge. Bandwidth is a huge challenge, and I think that I mentioned yesterday that I would, I would mention that. Everyone involved is way too busy. It's just not, un you know, we come in, okay, let's talk about climate. Well, you know, one out of 28 of the Met Service people that we met with had even had climate in their position description. Everyone is too busy. And t too busy for what? Too busy to have new stuff come into their, their, their system. Come, can you meet with me? Yeah, maybe next month. Okay, we meet for an hour. Can we, you meet regularly? Mm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, so time, it's just about limits of pushing our, our, our systems and, uh, to maximum productivity with minimum sort of cost and minimum uh, inputs. 
Um, and it's not just that, it's also our systems. So we're, we're operating right at the very edge in our systems. And so there isn't a whole lot of sort of flexibility to take on new experimental stuff because what if you get it wrong? And so bandwidth to me from the, the amount of time and, the, and also in bandwidth to be able to have you know, sort of our systems be less fragile because we're not operating right at the edge is an important one. So last thing is that personally for me, um, it, because World Bank and USAID and all the aid agencies are spending literally billions and billions and billions of dollars a year on development, and that mainstreaming climate information into not just on the front of their websites, because I can tell you it's on their websites, but mainstreaming into their loan portfolios and in their grant portfolios, which frankly not very much is there. So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Follow up questions for Jim in particular. Adam? Jim, would you call your work in IRAP um, science, policy, or some other word? Well, it, it certainly is science, both physical and social science, because we're, we are advancing, we believe, sort of uh, filling knowledge gaps. I wouldn't say it's policy um, because we're not setting policy nor are we actually um, working with people that are, it really is on sort of the applications end because we're primarily in the industry. Where I would hope that um, we can influence policy with our work and is the last statement that I made. I would, I, I would love to see us affect um, the loan and grant portfolios of these funding agencies so that it can go beyond sort of policy statements on the website to actual operations. So I would say it's, it's a uh, policy, well, what did, whatever the title is um, uh, of the project, but it certainly is research for decision making. So, Jim, I'm going to ask you the, this question, but I've been thinking about it all morning, and that's um, we throw around, a lot of us that throw around social science. We just throw it out there as part of a sentence that we have to take out on board in some way or another, but we don't really define what that means, and it is so variable. So when you say and social science, can you be more specific about what that actually looks like? Well, absolutely. So... Um, it, the U of A team is uh, primarily, I'd say everyone but myself, are the social scientists. Um, and what we do literally is do these vulnerability assessments. We, re, we uh, employ rigorous social science methods to understanding the vulnerability of households and therefore broader into the community. Um, we um, do surveys, household surveys, we have focus groups, we have phone conversations, we um, it, do multiple approaches to uh, getting that information. Uh, let's understand the vulnerability. Vulnerability being a function of exposure. Everyone gets exposed, but it's also sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Are we sensitive? My neighbor will, may likely be more sensitive than I am to the same exposure because perhaps I have diversity in my employment. I'm, uh, he's 100% a farmer and maybe I'm a school teacher and my wife's the farmer. Um, and then adaptive capacity, do I have access to, to um, a credit? Do I have access to money to be able to bounce back? That we understand is full vulnerability assessments and that is a rigorous social science uh, that's approached that. Stakeholder needs assessments, understanding and doing it in a, you know, I, I was talking to Dave Bihar um, uh, yesterday, and you know, stakeholder, I mean, they, the, the uh, stakeholder meetings are engaging with stakeholders, sort of burning out the community. We have to find ways of d doing these needs assessments in a way that isn't like, oh, here we are one more time trying to figure out what do the stakeholders need. And we'd have methods for that. Um, understanding a network, um, a, I, did, I mentioned social network analyses. That's really... Uh, uh, and I'm a physical oceanographer, that's way hard, harder than anything I ever did, to really understand it and understand it well and understand what happens when one, one entity in these, these spaghetti diagrams of who talks to whom and who has power and how are things influenced, and that all changes over time under what conditions. So that's, you know, I could go on, but I'll stay with, with that, but that's the kind of social science that we're working on. Okay, so um, specific to Jim, Susie 